Welcome to what is normally Retro Fanfic Retrospective, the podcast where we talk about old fanfiction, but occasionally gets co-opted by one or the other of us to record something else that we feel like doing at the time. And for various reasons, since we're not quite recording every week at this odd time, we have another episode of Dom and Tori discussing animation. In this case, some kind of Australian cartoon that I should apparently be the one watching because I'm the one with small children. Enjoy. So last time we talked about uh, Midnight Gospel, which was a very adult, very heady show. And so to contrast, this week I decided that we should try out a very, very kids-oriented show called Bluey. Yeah. Bluey is fun. <laughs> was more, more fun than the last one, I think. Yeah, more fun. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> Bluey debuted on, on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's channel, hereafter referred to as ABC, on October 1st, 2018. It's uh, done by Ludo Studios, and it's done entirely in Australia, with Australian animators, Australian uh, writers, storyboarders, musicians, uh, all the way. It's cool, too, because I read that they... I tried to find out who... Well, first of all, it's a show about a mom and a dad and a and two kids, basically, and they they play imagination games, yeah. and they're all dogs. But I looked into this, and I was trying to find out who played the two little girls, little dogs, Bluey and Bingo. And the only <laughs> thing, they're not credited, and the only, there's a bunch of rumors that it's actually, like, the creator's children who play them. Yeah, that's the internet rumors swirling around. They're kind of known to be just maybe... Uh, a couple of the production staff's kids, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it's interesting because there are other child actors credited with some of the voices of their friends, etc. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I like that rumor and that theory, though. It's like, you know, it's actually their kids. But there are re- actually <laughs> really amazing voices. And the reason I like yeah. that rumor is because lends this authenticity to me because sometimes it feels like the show is just kids talking and yeah it really does sound like kids talking to their dad yeah like as if of some time. of it was like you know say something like this and they said something you know that would actually make sense to them in that situation yeah the uh the actor that uh, plays the father bandit is david mccormick and they record in Sydney um, entirely by themselves, with no other voice actors, no other visuals, nothing, just just the script. Wow, I didn't know that. And the um, and Melanie Zanetti, who plays Chili, uh, uh, which is the, the the mother, is another Australian performer, and it's been reported that Zanetti and McCormick have not actually met at, ever. <laughs> wow. So this show has come together remarkably well for all of that. And I, I guess mm-hmm. we got to really give props to the voice actors for being able to do that. But I'm wondering if I didn't do a lot of research into the accredited voice actors. My curiosity was mostly about the who are Bluey and Bingo. <laughs> um, I want to yeah. know. But they that, must be parents or have interacted with children because they just talk exactly like it. I think both performers were drawn to the project after reading a script and realizing how much it's like interacting with their kids. Totally makes sense. So yeah, should we talk about the the premise of this show? I think I mentioned is like the mom and dad and the kids, but like literally every episode is just them playing an imagination game. Right. Um this show is entirely just a um a family, a father, a mother and their two kids who play um, who do freeform imagination games all the time. Mm-hmm. There's no antagonist, there's no m- magic thing that happens, there's no high concept, which is part of the reason why they had such a hard time selling selling it at first. They uh, they compared it to trying to sell what like Seinfeld is. It's, it's a show about nothing, really. Nothing yeah, happens. Except that, you know, every episode is, like the antagonist of the episode, for instance, is something in their imaginary game goes wrong, or there is actually an imaginary villain. However, there's also always some sort of lesson that one of the kids learns, which obviously the recipe for a great kids show. Yeah, uh, the creator is quoted as saying something like, 
that a lot of the goal of the, well, the show was trying to get parents to um, be okay with freeform, um, freeform imagination. Uh, quote, there's no counting in Bluey. There's no learning this or that. Just show them playing. It's to show parents that the kids aren't just mucking around. They're learning to play, learning to, sh- learning to share, and generally you can just put your feet up and let them do it. Oh, man. Uh, quoted, <laughs> which is a quote from uh, Joe Brum, the uh, show creator, March 25th, 2019, from PerthNow.com. Maybe that's why I fell in love with this show so instantly, is it is about play-centered education <laughs> and about mm-hmm. student-centered learning or child-centered learning, really. But right. The cool, the best part about it to me is how often the parents participate in the play. It's almost every episode. (laughs) And then again, there are multiple times they happen, things happen in public, and the parents are really embarrassed, but they fully (laughs) commit every single time to whatever the game is. Especially the dad will be like, oh, please don't make me do this now. But then he'll still do it because his kid asked. Yeah. Like, there's a moment where they're playing, like, bus stop or something, and, like, the kids were waiting at the bus stop, and the dad pulls up with, like, a, a wagon, and there's other people there at the bus stop waiting, and, like, the kids get on, get ready to go, and the dad, like, talks to one of the other passengers, uh, do, do you want to hop on? They're like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm all right, mate. Go on. <laughs> yeah, it also seems like they live, the setting is also beautiful. They live in this, like, community where they know their neighbors, and they hang out with their neighbors, and they know the people at the bus stop, like, you know, they know people are neighborhood. And also, it's a really pretty landscape because they're in some, like, beautiful tropical area of Australia. Yeah, the show is set in Brisbane, Australia, which is the most third most populous city in Australia after um, Sydney and Melbourne and is the capital of Queensland. So it's a semi-tropical uh, environment. Yeah, and they kind of have an indoor-outdoor living in their home. Um, I liked it because it's, like, it's very, like, it's a pretty small house, but the fact that they have a yard and outdoor living space just, like, makes their whole environment seem really open. I kind of want to live there. <laughs> a lot of the locations are based on real-world uh, Brisbane locations. The uh, Ludo Studios is in, um, I have it written down here, Fortitude Valley? Hmm. Na, 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 na. Yeah, Fortitude Valley, which is an inner suburb of Brisbane, and... The studio and everything besides the aforementioned voice actors uh, takes place in this studio in Brisbane. All the all the writing, all the storyboarding, all the animating. The only things that don't is some uh, post production and other voice acting, which takes place in South Brisbane, which is a city or inner suburb of Brisbane, according to, to Wikipedia. So they have a lot of locations that are famous to people there, and they you know, send people out to take pictures and they decide beforehand what locations they, they want to include. So a lot of it is a kind of love letter to the city they live in. Yeah, I was going to say that you can kind of sense they really like, they really love it. Um, <laughs> made me love it too. I was just like, man, what if that was my life? Be so right, yeah, happy. I was thinking like, <laughs> it'd be so fun to travel. The- oh, travel. Hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the nice thing is that I like that the show is not, it seems like a perfect family almost, but really because every episode is just focused on the part of the day where the parents are able to play with the kids. Because there are times when, you know, mom has to go do something, dad has to go do something, dad's busy with work. The the episodes Mm -hmm. are only seven minutes long. So really you can kind of tell it's highlighting the seven minutes of play that the parents participate in with their children. And you can still imagine that they go on and have their lives around. <laughs> but what it draws attention to is the fact that you only need those seven minutes to play with your kids before you go to work. And it creates a whole yeah. world. Um, is there any other, any particular episodes that stood out for you? Oh, yeah. You know, I have the list. There's <laughs> there's so many. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, they're we can't really... all so fun. <laughs> Yeah, we talked about the concept of the, of the show in general, and it's there's not too much more to it than that. Just uh, kids and the parents and the kids' friends and sometimes the parents' friends playing along. Yeah, and they have cousins, and I think that's the dad's brother's dad's brother, yeah. Yeah, family. And, oh, yeah, uh, the I dad's did. Br- 
I was sorry, go on. The dad's brother, um, Uncle Stripe, is voiced by Dan Brum, which is the younger sibling of of Joe Brum, the show's creator. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so... Also, uh, okay. also Brum's mother... Uh, Brahma's mother voiced um, Nana Healer in that one episode with the grandparents. Mm-hmm. And Susie Brum, Joe's wife, works as a storyboard artist on the series. Wow. So yeah. this is like kind of a family affair. <laughs> Very <laughs> and, literally. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you'll notice, on every episode, Joe Brahma is credited as the writer. So a lot of this is just lifted from their own life, it sounds like. Yeah. More or less. That's great. I mean... One of the things I love about it is that every game the kids play is different. In each episode, it's focused kind of on a different game, or usually a different game, basically. Um, you know, one of the yeah. early ones is like Magic Xylophone. I think that might be the first one, where <laughs> they get to freeze their dad with the Magic Xylophone. And then, you know, it goes a little too far, and someone gets frozen permanently. And like I mentioned, everyone, you know, the kids and the family always have 100% commitment to the game. Um, mm-hmm. Oh man, I was going somewhere with that, but uh, the oh yeah, that they always set it up as usually the kids are like, we're gonna play this game, and then the parent, whoever's responding, is like, either like, oh no, not that game or that game, and then it'll do the episode <laughs> title is the name of the game. Usually, it's not always that, but I love it that it's established no. this that we're being exposed to this game for the first time, but for them, you know, they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's this just catalog of games. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> there's one I just had, there's there's games where they just play, like, going to work. There's games where they play dry, driving a taxi. Um, but there's also, like, a lot more inventive ones. Um... Shoot, I had one pulled up that I really... Oh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, episode five of season one, Shadowlands, which is such a great name. It's all about the kids (laughs) going through the Shadowlands, which is literally just going through the shade when they're on a picnic and trying to get from under the shade of a tree to a picnic blanket. But every step of the way, something happens. Like, the wind sways the shadow of a very thin palm tree, and they're going to fall off. Or, like, a car Mm -hmm. that was casting a shadow leaves, and then it seems like this huge gap. But the crazy thing about it is the show represents everything literally. Like, never does it go into the kids' heads to, like, show what they see. It's just, but we're we're still 100% buying in to the fact that this is the reality (laughs) of their world right now. Like, I'm going to fall, I'm going to die, I'm going to fall in the lava. (laughs) And all we see is grass, but we totally believe it's lava. Yeah, and like the kids just lying on the grass, like writhing around. <laughs> yeah, well, like full because the characters have full commitment to their imagination narrative. It's both silly and fun to watch, just like it's fun to watch kids play, but also like draws <laughs> them into their world. Are there any um, episodes in particular you wanted to talk about? Well, there's. It's like every few episode. They, they go, they're they all seven minutes long, and they're all pretty easy to digest, but every so often there'll be a, a chunkier episode in there that, that hits kind of hard. Mm-hmm, yeah. Like, um, well, I started watching this series because my sister and her niblet uh, comes over, mm-hmm. and we'll, we want to put something on, and that was the first time they're like, okay, let's do this. I'm like, oh no, not a, not a, not a preschool cartoon. I, this is going to be complete crap. <laughs> Oh, true. Then, so then, many are so much worse yeah. than they used to be, too. Like, because yeah. they can crank them out with, like, bad CGI. Yeah. And uh, Bluey was designed to be a co-view- co-viewing experience. And so, like, after watching, like, one of these episodes, I'm like, this is cool. This is a show I want to keep watching even after the, the kid goes home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I didn't even have a kid here with me, and I was just, like, you know, cranking through the episodes. Of course, You know, I'm home from work uh, where I usually work with preschoolers, and I miss them like crazy. So it was sort of like (laughs) getting my kid time in a way, because the kids were so real. You know, they felt like, oh, I'm hanging out with the kids right now. 
Yeah. Like, every so often there's a uh, episode like Copycat, where, like, we're, we're just watching the show, and, like, the oldest kid who's six just starts the game where they're copying the dad uh, throughout the day, and they're, they're doing this to hilarious effect, <laughs> to, like, uh, confusing the, the neighbors and, and everything. <laughs> yeah. And, but at one point, when they're out on the walk, they find a uh, bird that's been attacked by a cat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I, that's not where I expected this episode to go at all. <laughs> yeah, that episode was one of the ones, like, it made me cry. Yeah, uh, they find a little injured uh, budgie. They wrap it up, put it in a box, take it to a vet, and at the vet, it dies. And they, they're all very open and frank and kind of caring about this to the kid. And the kid's trying to, uh, Bluey is trying to understand and process it to the point where when they get home, they want to recreate the experience as a, as a playtime. Yeah. So they, they have like, they, they have the younger sibling pretend to, to be the budgie and they wrap it up and they go through all the steps of driving it and taking it to the vet. And the mom's playing along who uh, wasn't there the first time. And they take it to the vet and the mom's playing the vet and is like, Good news, the budgie got better, and, and the blue is like, "No, no, mom, you're supposed to supposed to say that the budgie died." And they're like, "Are are you sure, Bluey?" Yes, yes, that's what happened. <laughs> so that's where they take the play that time. Yeah, that one really hit home for me because we um, I work in a pre K classroom, and several months ago, one of our students um, was out at the coast and with their parents you know, a four-year-old, and was swept away by a sneaker wave, died, along with his sister. And, it I mean, it was a huge hit for the whole community, but when I went back into that classroom, you know, I cried and I would processed it and I would like, tried to deal with my grief, but the kids were all pretending to be dead. <laughs> that was the game they were right. playing. So they were like, no, she's dead now. We're going to take her over here. They didn't really fully understand what it meant, but playing was a way to process what it meant. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I wanted them to keep exploring that. I, I think, you know, it was harder for our lead teacher, but I think that play is the way that kids learn. And I appreciated that the show took it and treated it. You know, they were very real. They didn't say the budgie ran off to fantasy land. You know, they didn't lie to the kid, like, the dog went to the farm, and the kid processed yeah. through play, and every adult respected that that's what the kid wanted. Like, are you sure? <laughs> okay, then yes, you know? Yeah. It was funny, I think, watching us during that episode, because, like, uh, me, my sister, and my mom were watching it with, with, the, with the kid at the time, and, like, a couple months ago, one of our dogs died, and uh, the the niblet was still trying to process it, and, like, when, when the concept when the real concept of the episode came up, like, like me, my sister, and my mom all tensed up and like looked at each other, like side at each other and just like tried not to react to like, oh, where's this show going? Oh no, <laughs> this is going to make things worse. Right. But we were very, um, happy with how it worked out and how it didn't make things worse, <laughs> to be honest, but just talked about it. Yeah. And still had, it had a you know a serious real resolution that didn't take things lightly, but was still you know in the spirit of the show. At the very end, the little sister who's playing the budgie comes running out <laughs> of the the medical the hospital they have set up and is like squawking around. And the mom's like chilly to to Bluey, who Bluey is mostly the show focuses on. Though it focuses a lot on the, all the characters, but yeah. it's like uh, somebody probably should have told the budgie. <laughs> You know, after Bluey said the budgie's <laughs> dead. <laughs> so it still ends on kind of a, a cute <laughs> note, and we're not, like, we're not lingering on it too long, because that's not how kids process. They, yeah. They process through play, and then they move on to the next game, and it comes up again later, but it's not, like, it's not the same way adults deal with things. Yeah. And it's also really, really interesting how just, I don't want to say unbiased, but... Th- a lot of the issues they talk about is stripped of a lot of the bias you find in kids' programming. Like, for example, a lot of the, uh, um, if you go to Google, like, the first question that'll pop up for Bluey is, is, is Bluey a boy or a girl? Because 
Bluey is portrayed as an energetic puppy, and none of those are typically feminine traits. But anybody who's been around any kids will know that's that's just how kids act. <laughs> right. And then the I think the main key, like for me, because um, I could tell that the show is pretty like I want to say like gender normative, heteronormative. In, yeah. in many ways that it constructs the nuclear family. Like, all the families they meet have, like, a mom or a dad or sometimes a single mom, they mention. There's some things they deal with, but it's it's pretty traditional family. I actually, like, because Bluey has the same coloring as her dad, I thought Bluey was mm-hmm. supposed to be, like, a boy dog until the dad refers to <laughs> them as girls in, like, the fifth or sixth episode. So I, like, literally <laughs> made that assumption all the way through. And actually, the first thing I thought is it's like, oh, the boy dog has Polly Puppy, who's a, you know, a toy, <laughs> essentially a baby doll because they're dogs. That's pink. I was like, oh, that's good that they have a, a boy with a pink doll. And then it turns out Blue's actually a girl. So, I mean, either way you slice it, though, it's. I mean, I even, you know, kind of like kicked myself a little for making that assumption. I think it was mostly because I assumed <laughs> the creators would have made, you know, like one boy, one girl, and the boy would be the same color as the dad, and the girl would be the same color as the mom. But they didn't. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, and I like that there's two girls, too, because it makes the show, like... I mean, not that gender should be that specific for kids, but they're exposed to those messages. It's nice that it's, like, mostly about the quote-unquote girls, you know? Yeah. And that Bluey's closest relationship seems to be with her dad. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of kids' media out there that's geared towards, like, I don't want to say, like, boy empowerment, but that's kind of what it is, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's almost and, as if, like, nowadays, it's like, there's an effort to include more girls, but then there's also a cross-effort that, like, if there's a girl, there should also be a boy, or boys won't be interested in it kind of thing. Now, this show right. doesn't read like that at all. It's like, I don't think, first of all, I think the kids <laughs> watching it are probably young enough not to care. But, like, the show also makes it so that their gender is pretty irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, they're just playing games. Yeah. And, like, uh, the <laughs> they do they do also do things where, like, they have both the boys, the little boys and little, little girls do child care stuff just as equally in, yeah. later, in the, later in the show. Yeah. Yeah, like, gender doesn't really come up that much. Um except in, like, pronoun usage, basically. Yeah, which, it that's what it's like to be a kid, right? <laughs> and also, it seems like both of the parents work, and I think the only thing that kind of distinguishes the dad a little more than the mom is that, like, he's a little more embarrassed to be doing things with his kids in public than the mom is. <laughs> in public. But, like, that's... Like, some... That's not but necessarily that's like some... a male thing, you know? <laughs> no. But just like some things, though, when when the dad's really into into the sh- into the uh, game, he kind of relishes in embarrassing himself sometimes. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I I was yeah. trying to track. Like, I think there's a lot more. The only that was the other thing that stood out. It seems like the dad will play games more often than the mom will, but they all play, and that's cool. Just like seems yeah. like mom gets less screen time for some reason. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's what it feels. I think your eyes just always drawn to Bandit whenever they're on screen right. because it's just a great character. Bandit is a great character. He's really <laughs> funny. Like, I mean, they're all great, but like, he's hilarious. There's one episode where he, um, the kids talk about getting a pet, and <laughs> it's called Sean because apparently, Sean, yeah, just like every episode, there's one established thing that's going to come up again, one established game, and that's that his hand or paw is a pet, I think, emu named Sean. Yeah, a disobedient emu named Sean. Yeah. Yep, yep. And, oh my god, so many things happen with Sean, and it's so funny. He starts, you know, pecking everybody. He gets into the fridge <laughs> and starts eating everything in the fridge. He, they take him for a walk, and he starts running and, you know, dragging Bandit along behind him <laughs> because he's his arm. There's a consistent yeah. thing that goes on that one of the neighbors almost never speaks but it's just kind of, like, subjected to bandits playing with his kids. And in, he, like, the worst possible moment. <laughs> yeah, and she's always, like, shocked, or just, like, Hurf, kind of thing. Well, well, like, well, like, she'll be looking out the window, and and he'll be 
at the window cleaning it with his with his ass or something. Yeah, that did happen. Yeah, he was he was being controlled and he had to clean the window with his bottom. Yeah, in the copycat episode, he walks up to her and he goes, "Like I'm," just says something weird and starts slapping his butt, like and waiting for Bluey to copy. And Bluey just looks at the neighbor, and shrugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because just Bluey was hanging. yeah, he was trying to get Bluey not to copy him by doing something yeah. outrageous. <laughs> But oh, I, I love man. that it's always always the same neighbor too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Sean the emu also like <laughs> runs by the neighbors. Like Bandit says something like, "Sorry, I can't control him," or he's still learning. <laughs> or I don't even remember what it was. But yeah, just something very understanding about the invisible emu. <laughs> yeah, and and that's the part you know I love that because I think that the having that straight man or straight <laughs> woman, I don't know show up every so often straight dog they're all dogs like dogs don't even have gender what are we talking about anyway show up every <laughs> so often allows you kind of see how the rest of the world is is perceiving these characters because we get so invested in their fantasies watching the show like one time there's this one episode where the mom is playing with the girls and they've drawn on their hands mm-hmm and they're climbing along the reclining dad, and the hands in the episode are, like, kind of animated as independent characters, where, like, their arms going way too long off screen. Yeah. And it'll, like, go between, like, the hands acting independently, then zooms out to all the dogs with their hands down. I kind of liked that, because when I was watching it, I was paying particular attention to the hand animations, so I was like, even if they have things that are closer to fingers than digits, I can't imagine them moving them that way. No, it's just complete um, surrealism for that point. <laughs> right, exactly. Because like, they don't really and move like, their hands like that in other scenes, but it's not like totally no. weird. It's just like sometimes they're crossing, the, they have four total digits that are, they're, they're usually a little closer to hands, but than actual well, like, sometimes They like, cross the, the side two over the middle two in front of them and i'm like that's uncomfortable well like there's a couple times where they the hands like rotated in place and like <laughs> that would not have worked so the, mm-hmm. the the actual actual person would have to like run around the hand down yeah and, like the, the arms going, going off screen are uh proportionally too long and they didn't really it wasn't necessary to pay attention to that detail because it read totally correctly <laughs> and it was the right thing yeah. to do you know and, and i don't it, know how they knew that was the right thing to do but I wasn't, like, I was paying attention to it because I was like, hold on. But it didn't bother me. <laughs> it was, like, fine. It, it was uh, fun to notice, really. Yeah. And, like we've mentioned before, there's no, like, high concept, no antagonist. But they do these uh, stories and, and these uh, imaginations and these plays where, they, and because they do that, they can do kind of whatever they want. They can tell a different kind of story every time. Like, with that hand one, they have like, a story about two uh, two siblings and a fairy running up a mountain being tricked by a fox. Yeah. Yeah, and that one was one of the more abstract ones, where it was mostly about the story being told through the hands, which is super fun, you know? But then mm-hmm. they have other ones that are more about, like, very real things that happen. Like, there's a couple episodes where um, oh, one of these is in the second. I was able to see a couple episodes from the second season um, using an Australian VPN. But anyway, there's at least one in the first season. Ah, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, there's only still only five I could find, though. But I'll tell you about it later. Um, All right. There's still, uh, there's still an episode in the first season where it's... A bingo is the younger sibling. who's supposed to be... Four, and I'm assuming they're in human years, even though they're dogs. They're more, very anthropomorphic dogs. They walk on two legs. Even when they go I on mean, all the- fours, their knees bend forward like humans do, you know? <laughs> so, Yeah, th- this is a story about an Australian human family dressed kind of in the guise of dogs. So, yeah, yeah they're basically totally. people. Sometimes they do dog things, though, and it's really funny. Um, well, well, what well, confused can- the heck out of me at first was, because um, like, I watched them out of, out of order, so I saw the um, youngest cousin mm-hmm. in uh, in one of the episodes. I'm like, okay, so is that one like actually just a dog? Because it just runs on all four legs like a dog and barks and bites and, and bites, it, yeah. this is creeping creeping me out. And then they're like, no, it's a baby. Like, oh, okay, no, I I, yeah. I get it. It took a m- moment to digest the metaphor. Yeah, 
that um yeah she's a baby and socks and she <laughs> also that's the other thing is all their their two cousins are also girls when they're younger than them but yeah um yeah socks also one times tries to poop in the yard you know but like squats <laughs> like a dog does even though they use the toilet you know but um yeah that one's really that's funny like, think- they're like socks no <laughs> Because it's not appropriate, like but a baby could totally try to poop in the yard, you know? Exactly. Like a one or two year old wandering around the yard might just try to poop in the yard. Exactly. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, uh, Bingo is four and Bluey is six. And mm-hmm. um, there's a couple times where Bingo basically like is too shy. Bluey's very outgoing and kind of overbearing sometimes. So they have like very strong personas. Some of the episodes are just, like, strong, like, narratives that keep going, where, like, under the surface, something keeps bothering Bingo, and she doesn't get Mm -hmm. to say it until the end of the episode. But then, like, mom or dad kind of comes in. It's like, Bingo, uh, I'm, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of the one I just saw in season two, but it's like, what mom says to Bingo is, Bingo, does sometimes, do you sometimes, say yes with your outside your outside voice when your inside voice is saying no and they're <laughs> like oh and then everyone like apologizes to her because basically what happened is like she kept saying things were okay that her family was doing okay. and i love those ones that i just kind of like loop around to like very simply stating in a way of like a preschooler or early elementary school could understand that like sometimes we give too much and but not like necessarily saying she should do anything differently. Just being like, sometimes these happen. These things happen. Yeah. Uh, with the Bingo episodes, it seems to end in one of two ways: where either Bingo learns to speak up, or Bluey learns to uh, account for somebody else's feelings. Totally. And there's even one where um, the dad has to Bandit has <laughs> to learn not to treat. Bingo, like she's as old as Bluey because he was playing too rough with her. Yeah, that's such a real story. And it's, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, because the dad wasn't trying to be mean or n- neglectful. They just kind of forgot that the you know, Bingo was four. <laughs> that was the only episode where I was like, that's so like a dad and so like a mom. Because the mom will right. often do that, like stepping in and being the mature one thing where the dad plays more like a kid. But but it felt it felt true to the character though, being how Bandit is always all in in every game. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah. There was also the episode later um, teasing, where they go mm, through yes. all the ways that Bandit teases the kids, and they do it in an interesting circular format, where it's like they laid out all the things the dad did was teasing, and then they're like, "Yes, that's right." And you, you said that was teasing, but what happened after that? And what happened after that were the the kids engaged and turn it into a game and then they turn it back on, on the dad. Right. And so, so th- then they ask the, like the real important question, what's the difference between playing with somebody and teasing them? And like, they showed that at the end by with one of the games, the dad tried to play was just the kids didn't have any fun. He's like, Oh, you know what? That was wrong of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And he acknowledged it. And I actually like really appreciated that. Like, I think that, like, realistically, men are taught to interact with children by, like, sort of becoming childlike themselves. Like, they're not taught right. as much about care and protecting the kids' feelings. They're taught, they're like, oh, I'm the funny dad, you know, because I do silly things. And so for, right. like, the episode to take it and, like, make even a comment to a father who might be watching it with a child that, like, sometimes I'm not paying enough attention to my kids' feelings when I'm playing games with them is a really important thing to say. It's so important, like, when you're dealing with a kid, because, like, I've been spending a lot of time in quarantine. My, uh, my mom and I have been spending time in the same sort of quarantine bubble with, like, uh, my sister and, and her kids. So I've been spending a lot of time with a little three-year-old kid, and, like, just the other day, we were, like, playing soccer, and the kid, like, sat down and had a problem. We had, a, like, a like a r- long moment where we just had to, like, kind of wait and coax, like, the feelings out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's a big, we're just yeah big we just had to it. wait and be like like it's okay to be upset but, but let's talk about it so we can feel better about it and figure out what's wrong i mean saying i'm here when you're ready to talk is like mm-hmm. basically the formula format that i've always used is like are you feeling a little bit this 
and they, you know, they responded though, it's okay to feel a little bit like this. Let me know when you're ready to talk. Let me know if I can help. And then you give them right. space. Like, just like, a, basically you could do the same thing with an adult, you know? Like, it's, it's pretty <laughs> basic, right? <laughs> but we don't always would, think of it. I mean, you would think, I, I think a lot of people didn't get treatment like this when they were at that age. So, like, it's yeah. a learned behavior. It's, it's, it's not intuitive, exactly. Well, I think that, you know, for me, there's always been this element of empathy that I've always had, but learning, unlearning certain bad behaviors that I picked up it, is important, but also learning, like, how to simplify and, and be this most, the di- most direct I can with kids and what they need was also, like, a big process of education that I experienced working with children. Yeah, as someone that works with children, what do you think about the general child care psychology message of the show is like? Well, I like, they have a couple episodes where they're at school, and the cool thing is Bluey is supposed to be six. I don't know what the Australian education system is like, but like, here they would be like in first or second grade, and they would be like, no, in first, yeah, first grade. Either end of kindergarten, end of kindergarten or beginning of first, usually at six. But even in right. kindergarten, they would be studying letters and numbers and stuff. But this school is much is, is like a preschool. It's all play focused. Um, they don't even really focus on the parts of the day where they learn um, anything other than like important life lessons they learn through play. And they have a really cool preschool teacher who, in the first episode, called Calypso, which is the name of the preschool teacher. She appears. She basically just like mediates a conflict between two people between two groups of kids by listening to their stories and then helping them understand. She doesn't even do that much. Like once they hear each other's stories and sit down with each other, they're like, Oh, I completely understand yeah. why I, that was upsetting for you. I didn't understand it before. She makes them stop yeah, the teacher, and think. And I was just like, the that's teacher, kind of what the show does. It makes the kids like, makes you stop and think. Yeah. The teacher mainly says to the kids, Hey, this is going over there. Why don't you go ask, ask them about it? Yeah, exactly. Like offers that <clears throat> encouragement, and the parents are are doing a really great, like very similar thing. I mean, I would almost consider like their house a uh, play center educational space because the parents basically perform the same activity. I think the preschool episodes literally, or I guess they're not preschool. I don't know. The school episodes literally exist to enforce the idea that like teachers are also important people in helping kids. Because basically the parents are helping the education in the same way the teacher is. And I think that's the way that it should be, if that makes sense. And also all the the, uh, other parents, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, you know, the aunts and uncles and all the kids, they hang out with their parents. Everybody participates in helping children, regardless of whether those children are their own. Like, it never seems like there's favoritism or, like, one parent is not going to tell <laughs> one thing to a different child they wouldn't tell their own child. Yeah, there's more than one episode where um, a Bandit expands the, the scope of the kids' play when, when another kid wanders in. Yeah. So it's a, I, I think like, it's a really great modeling of how I think education should commence for children. And, and also the parents' participation in that. And like I mentioned before, the seven minutes of play, just take that time. To have that time yeah. with your kids, it's so important. <laughs> it also pretty. It would also be pretty easy for them to get preachy about stuff, but when they do have those messages, they kind of convey it in a softer way, where, where they have like the anti um, anti tablet, anti phone episode. They don't really just come out and say it; they just kind of show it, show what happens, and let the characters like look at it and feel about it and then come to a different conclusion instead of just come out and saying this is bad don't do this yeah i mean i don't how did that episode go down specifically do you remember uh it was the bob billy episode with the puppet yeah and like so uh bingo is in kindy kindergarten at the moment and they take home a puppet for the weekend or a week or something and they take pictures right. pictures and put it in a in an album and they pass the album around and they're looking at the album and all the cool things the puppet had done before and while 
during like that that weekend, like they'll be doing something, then they'll they'll all pull out their tablets and like one of the other parents uh takes out takes out their phone and takes a picture. And at the end of it, they're like, "Okay, here's a picture of all the stuff we di- we did with the with the puppet." And it was all of them just playing on the tablets and watching TV. And they're like, "Oh, this isn't fun at all." Yeah, I like that one. You're right because at the very end, it's just the kids who look at the pictures and say, "Oh, Bob Bilby didn't have any fun." We need to go and yeah. take him and have some fun. So then the parents <laughs> facilitate that, and everyone's happy. <laughs> and, and it's like, not really, really like. It's not really preachy. Yeah, it's not. It's like it's not really. It's saying like, don't waste all your time on devices, basically. But it's not saying it's. It's mainly pointing out the kids' preference for that, and also like not saying one way or another you should or shouldn't. Yeah, and it's like they weren't even realizing they were doing it. Like when the dad looks at all the photos, he's like, "Oh, geez." <laughs> yeah. Well, I like too. It was the kids who looked at it. And felt bad. I mean, and the parents didn't really have to say anything about it, you know? Yeah, they, they didn't say, well, what should you have done? Or They were just like, the kids were like, Let, let's do something better. Totally, which makes you think, like, the parents weren't against them using those devices. It was just the kids who took the time to reflect and say, like, oh, maybe we should have done some more things while we have this opportunity. Mm-hmm. Giving the kids that autonomy, I really appreciate it. So the show was independently created in Australia by uh created by Joe Broom, who had the idea and shopped it around for a while and had a problems selling it to anybody because like literally nothing happens <laughs> and that's hard to ele- elevator pitch to people. And um in uh twenty seventeen ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and BBC co sponsored like a uh one episode pilot. And then after that, they got $20,000 bucks to make 52 episodes. <laughs> and then after, and then it got insanely popular in Australia. It was like one of the most wow. streamed shows on, on their services there. It's good. And then, yeah. And then after it got included on Disney plus worldwide, then it blew up huge. Pretty awesome. And I, I've heard, uh, even I've heard, I, I read on the internet that, the word mum has been worked into a uh, kid's vocabulary in place of mom. <laughs> oh, yeah, because the, uh, the intro to each episode goes, Mom! Mom! Eh. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun. It's actually, yep. I, would, I wanted to talk about the intro because it's, I didn't realize <laughs> the first few times, but it's actually a freeze dance competition. Ah. Oh. <laughs> That's like, every time someone keeps dancing after the music stops, the they have to stand off to the side, and that's when their intro comes in. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I didn't catch on until a few episodes in. I actually got a yeah, little I'll... tired of hearing the intro after a little while, because, you know, seven <laughs> minutes each episode, you're just like, intro every seven minutes. Yeah, for every um 21-minute episode on Disney+, Plus, you hear it three times, so... <laughs> yeah. And also, all that music, all that music was produced uh, in in house in the studio. Oh yeah, it's cute. They, they do music. music and yeah, they do the music and score each episode. Ah, uh, that's awesome. So the production process of the show takes about, um, according to a great article I read on, let me find the, on abc.net.au from. December 2nd, 2019, How They Make Bluey by Dan... Sorry for butchering this. Mm-hmm. Cole Simone. <laughs> uh, they described the uh, animation process, which was approximately 15 episodes are in development at any one time. Uh, the script writing process takes up to two months. Um, storyboarded, then storyboarded by the artists, who do 500 to 800 pictures over three weeks. Uh, then you get a black and white animatic that's then voiced. And then the animators spend four weeks animating the uh, the completed episode. Uh-uh. They also have a, they also pr- apparently have um, once they finish an episode every Friday they have like a viewing which is turned into like a viewing party where people where the production staff brings like their family, their friends, and their kids to kind of get a fresh reaction of the episode there. Well, that's great. I mean, I didn't know that's exactly what their process was because I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, mm-hmm. the thing I wanted to bring up is 
kind of the simplicity of the style. Like, it's not necessarily what you would call dynamic animation. It doesn't contain a lot of wrinkles or folds or action. And yet it's still, I don't know, maybe it is still dynamic. The The dog's bodies are rectangles with curves that sometimes yeah, uh- bend, but most of their motion is in arms, legs, and expression is in the eyes and the ears. And a, a lot of the designs of like the both the characters and the backgrounds and the objects are relatively flat looking, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, they're flat and they're like, very uh, consistently like rectangular with curved edges, which makes it very soft, but also very like uh, stark, I guess. Like the bright colors lend that as well. Yeah, it gets a real nice um, uh, picture book look, I think. Totally, and it it definitely reminds me of, of young childhood, like the bright colors and shapes. Um, but for instance, I've been watching like some of the new 101 Dalmatians cartoon, and that reminds me mm-hmm. of slightly older childhood because everything is kind of like an action sequence and all the, the edges are pointy. And this, a lot of the edges are soft and rounded. The lines are strong and not tapered, and there's mostly just movement is very... Uh, Fluid. Right. There's also the nice, um, like, soft pastel color palette they have throughout. Mm-hmm. Sort of highlight the subtropic environment that, that they live in. Totally. And I like that some of the character coloring they do is interesting, like, because they're supposed to be a family of blue healers. But, mm-hmm. uh, Mom, Chili, and Bingo are, um, like, just... Their coloring is just blocks of like a <laughs> lighter browns, basically, um, but like nice, comforting ones. Whereas um, yeah. Bluey and and the dad have like blue and black with brown muzzles, but then they also have little white lines on their fur that the other characters don't have, <laughs> which is very like blue old- healer looking. So <laughs> yeah, the the older dogs have also have some white mixed in in their coat. Yeah. And it's nicely blocked <laughs> out in just kind of curved patterns. And I think yeah. they match colors very well to like what those dogs would look like, well, but not making them, you know, as earthy as they normally would. Like kind of bringing out the lighter pastel feel of color. Well, they made them like actually blue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, which is fun. Yeah. And speaking of the character designs, I... Like, a part of me, like, knows their dogs watching it, and I kind of see that conceit, but nothing, no character really drives it home more than the little, um, uh, wiener dog character. <laughs> yeah. He's always <laughs> talking about how he's a sausage dog, and he's got short arms got short and legs. short legs. <laughs> short arms and legs. <laughs> Super cute. And a and lot of also characters see his- don't wear clothes, but if they do, they're, like, an accent or an accessory. Accessory. Yeah, this- it's not an important part of the character design. And it, it lends to that fact that you don't have to create all those, like, crazy dynamic folds in anything at all, really. Like, even when the character's bodies bend, it's there's not a lot of folding. It's just very, like, you know, the shape's just moving very organically. Yeah, there's not even a lot of sharp bends in the elbows, is there? It's mm-hmm. more of a curve. Yeah, it's very soft. And everything is very rounded, and I just like I feel like that could be done very poorly, but I think they done mm-hmm. they do it very well because um, they don't do the bendy arm thing. Like the arms are not, they don't have sharp elbows, but they don't feel like spaghetti. They're just like yeah, they, they move very naturally. I feel like they don't. What was it the well like with all Disney stuff with the bendy stuff? It's like they either add length or they like don't. Or they don't stretch it as much, but like in uh, Bluey, they make sort of, some sort of effort to make sure it looks like it takes up the same amount of space. Totally. Yeah. It it works. Yeah, they they. Well, I think what they did for their animation was basically because it's done digitally, even though it you know it's two D animation that's done digitally, like most things nowadays. But I think they mm-hmm. focused very basically on their underlying digital shapes and not applied a lot of, like, you know, for instance, the body is this rectangle, and it has a limited range of bend to it. 
so that when they animate it, you know, you know that the body can only bend this far, the arm can only bend this far. The arm is probably, like, the underlying shape of the arm is probably two different ovals, and they have a range of motion to them. So I think they did a good job restricting the range of motion to being very real. <laughs> but they do move a lot, I think. The, um... Mm-hmm. How would you phrase it? The the acting of each character, the the poses they make, how they react, how they move to stuff, and how often they do it is all very active and well done, I think. I think the call to make um, them, like, human, basically, like, humans and in, in, with dog skins was, was a very good one, <laughs> because there yeah. are times when the ears can add to the expression for dogs in a way that, like, humans couldn't, <laughs> and... Um, you know, they're basically humans most of the time, but they don't have to wear clothes. Their their ears being up, forward, down, back instantly tell you, like, a state of expression, as well as kind of the narrowing of the <laughs> eyes. And even sometimes they yip or they bark. And and those yeah. little things, like, give them so much more expression than they would otherwise have. Personally, I had fun... I, I rewatched some episodes today, and I, I had a lot of fun... Watching Bandit's tail. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wait, the tail, the most important part of the dog. I completely yeah, forgot. It, there's some parts where, like, he's doing, like, parent and dad stuff, and you can tell he's really enjoying what's going on because he's wagging his tail. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. also do a lot of, like, dancing movements where they, they shake their butt a little bit and the tail moves with <laughs> it. And it just, it, I don't yeah. know, it creates so much more interest, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I love those little details. I did have a long time where I spent like trying to figure out like how much they are like dogs and how much they are like humans. And <laughs> really, like where I landed was where they're like dogs is when dog-like traits can give them the most expression. Yeah, just basically when they want to. Yep. Yeah, and which is cute. how it should be, I think. It's adorable. <laughs> it's so fun, yeah. and I love. So that's Bluey. <laughs> that's Bluey. Yeah. Fun, cute, um, adorable, and I love it. <laughs> and I love it. I mean, I highly recommend, you know, you only need to commit seven minutes watching an episode and get the flavor of it. And, of course, you can get on Disney+. Plus. You can, if you search YouTube for the opening song, you'll find it right away and get a, a sense of what the animation style is like. So in the opening, all the characters are dancing, and the, the dances are just so cute and fun. Yeah. Check it out, right? I also kind of liked how Australian it was. Like, we get a lot of Americanization in our shows, and sometimes even, like, British stuff, sometimes Japanese stuff, but, like, we never see any slice of life from Australia in, a, like, an honest way. Yeah, we, we don't get that much of it, and it's very central to this community that all the creators are, like, a part of, too, which is great, yeah. this this town and uh, our city, I guess, but... It also seems like, by the way, they only ever, um, I don't, I think they go out to the city, like, once. They kind of live in what seems like a very, like, beautiful little suburb area. <laughs> um, but you can sometimes see the city in the background, which is cute. But, yeah, uh, they, most of the story takes place in their house, because that's yeah. all you really need. You gotta imagine that a lot of these people are you know, like they're designing and looking at like places they know and stuff they love. It's it was made by quote a tight knit team of mostly first time and local animators in Brisbane, and it's really well done. And I want to bring up again that the voices are so well done, and <laughs> all the kids are voiced by kids, and they just not only do they just sound exactly like kids, but they fit the scenario and the dialogue they're supposed to have perfectly. The, I don't know the how many be- they took, but yeah. they did incredible. Uh, and the chemistry between all the characters is amazing. I Like, I can't believe that they don't hear each other recording, or this is all separate takes put together, because it sounds real. <laughs> real conversation. It really sounds like a real conversation. Like, is if you just recorded a perfect play session between a family, you know, like one yeah. day where everything, I mean, for seven minutes went perfectly, you recorded all that dialogue. <laughs> uh, and I know, like, it, nothing would ever go like that. That's the kind of suspension of disbelief you have to have. Like, 
someone would have a potty break at some point, even though there are potty breaks depicted in the show. <laughs> They do very real, well, the, like, family things, like, you know, helping yeah. each other on the toilet, helping the kids on the toilet. Yeah. Like, my sister loved when they showed the back back seat, seat of their car. <laughs> oh, yeah, I it, love that, too, because, like, everything in the house is, like, the kids' toys are laid out one day, and they're supposed to clean up, and then they eventually do. And so it's all, like, mm-hmm. very cartoon world, but then in the back seat of the car, it's, like, lollipops stuck to the seats and, like, just trash everywhere. <laughs> Half-eaten food, graffiti, stickers, books, <laughs> etc. Yeah. And it's like the only time the scenes really look like the only time you're like, "Ew, that looks messy." The backseat of the car, and like, of course, <laughs> like that is the there's, reality. There was also one time a bandit was playing with the girls, and he's like in, in the middle of a, of a phrase, and he goes, "Oops, potty break." And the next scene is him sitting on the toilet with the two daughters, like dancing, and like. Oh, dancing over him while he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, and he's sort of like, uh, can you just, like, do this somewhere else? And they're like, nope. Like, okay. And then, 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 she, then, uh, then uh, Bluey goes, ew, stinky. And then he's like, then get out. <laughs> 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 You're free to leave. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what it does. It consolidates those funny moments of parenting and being around kids into something that, like, you know, is totally believable. In the moment, it takes it's nice. all you the still get a, elements. You still get a hint of the actual moments too. Yeah, yeah. I think at first, something I wished I'd seen in this show was like what the parents' lives are like with outside the like outside of their family and the kids. But I keep going back to the fact that it's focused on the play times <laughs> they have together, and I. I th- I think that'd be pretty boring because they're just totally. like, like the mom's a part-time airport security person and the father's an archaeologist, and like, that's not fun. <laughs> no, and that's you know at first I I had a sense of that because I was like, oh, well, I want this to feel a little bit more real because otherwise it kind of feels like a perfect life. But then as you watch the show go forward, you recognize it's playtimes with the kids, and it's not always perfect either. There's plenty of times where the parents make mistakes. The kids make mistakes, and there are times that are, like, troubling and trying, too, but they're troubling and trying in the way that that raising kids is. Now, to be fair, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't think there's a lot of, like, (laughs) temper tantrum moments, you know, like, screaming, trying to get out of the grocery store kind of things, but that's because the show is focused on play and the beauty of play, and I think that's fine. I, I love that it's that beautiful <laughs> and that at the same time it allows, it does ground you in reality with those certain moments, you know, yeah, like the dad being on the toilet or the dad <laughs> being embarrassed to do certain things in public or having mm-hmm. to make apologies for teasing too hard. So there is reality there. It's just not the gritty reality of, you know, adult life. It's kind of equally from the perspectives of the adults and the children in a way. Mm-hmm. And the only real negative downside of the show is feeling inadequate about being able to play with kids after watching Bandit do anything. Yeah, and maybe that's where I was coming from, but I also think that when I parsed, like, parsed and processed that a little bit more, I was not only reflecting all the times I've had awesome games with kids, <laughs> but also reflected, you know, on the times they pointed out that he was taking it too far also reflected on the fact that like, this is a good example of ways you can play with your children. And I think that's the lesson it's trying to teach to adults is like I said, take that time, but also like every episode is an example of a way you could play with them. And for adults who like feel like maybe along the way they've lost their imagination somehow, every episode is like, do this game, play taxi, play this. It's not that hard. (laughs) You know, let the kids lead. I, I think it is a really good example to, to parents. Yeah. Do that. So, if you have, like, a little preschool-aged kid and you want to watch a show with them, I highly suggest you th- throw on Bluey. It'll be fun for both of you. And even if you don't have a kid, take a look. It's a good piece of animation, and it's kind of good. I, I personally like seeing animation that's not um, L.A.-based or, like, um... North American based, even. Totally. I mean, 
Yeah. I can't say for sure if this show would appeal to people who aren't, you know, as kid-focused in their lives as I am, but I have the sense yeah. that it would, because it is a lot of fun, and each episode has its own stakes and drama that I rooted in play. And, and every story is fun for everyone. And every episode is pretty well constructed, too. And I, I also love that the parents and the kids play on equal footing. Like, it's never like the parents are just indulging the kids. Like, they're mm-hmm. always all having fun. So, <laughs> yeah. I think this is a good way to relearn fun, you know? Yeah. So, thanks for joining us in this serious discussion about not that serious show. <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? This is the most serious show. Sometimes it is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that this uh, is real evil life. witch. That evil witch that that uh, turns the, the horse to stone and chases chases the princess. Yeah, that was terrifying. <laughs> well, it was fun because like they kept on changing roles half in the middle. <laughs> I know. That was a good yeah. one. Yeah, another episode where the kids are at school together. Bluey's at school with her friends. Yeah. And. uh Another thing, you know, just to point out the last little bit is they kept changing roles because Bluey would like take to the side and whisper, Can I be I should be the horse now? Or, you know, like stuff like that. <laughs> and then they change places. Yeah. That happens a lot, is they'll they'll whisper out of character very briefly, I should do this, <laughs> do this now. And then they're like, Yep, okay. <laughs> um <laughs> it kinda like it never matters because you always know they're playing a game, you know, but it, it's still just the process of play being a Yeah. So I've been Dom. I have at times been Tori. <laughs> it has been rumored. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. Yes, we appreciate you. We hope yes. to hear from you. If you have anything we to hope say. To- <laughs> if we ever meet him in person, let's have an engaging, imaginative playtime. <laughs> that would be fun. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. See you later. We really need an outro <laughs> or something. Uh, yeah, but we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Or let's just do a freeze dance <laughs> contest. That sounds great <laughs> for an <laughs> audio podcast, yeah. Tori. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't see all the backflips I'm doing right now. Dom. <laughs> oh, I, that was one backflip too many. Yeah.